our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Every great revolution in history began with one thought, one person, one voice. It is acting on that voice, it's speaking one's mind that achieves greatness for mankind. We invite you to speak up, conquer your fears, change the world. Here is your hostess, a member of the California High School Speech Association Hall of Fame from Lincoln High School in Stockton, Karen Meredith. Public speaking has often been labeled the number one fear. However, it doesn't have to be. For over 50 years, the California High School Speech Association has been helping our students through competition and curriculum to get over that fear and become articulate and confident speakers. We'd like to share with you the values of being a competitive speech program, as well as having a strong foundation in public speaking curriculum. Business persons, teachers, and students have made the following observations. I think in my role as a supervisor, I saw expository speech used on a weekly basis, if not more often, in the meetings we had to go to. And people that were skilled at it were able to make literally millions of dollars. In expository speech, it's done for dramatic impact or for entertainment, but in real life, in the courtroom, it's done to help a jury understand a topic so that they can honestly and fairly make a decision about it. To me, it's probably one of the best skills that you can take with you uh, because what are we asked to do in the work world? We're asked to explain. We're asked to provide information. We're asked to provide uh, how-tos. And that's basically what the expository speech is. From my experience, especially in a uh, business like the Home Depot, where we're demonstrating a lot of products to a lot of homeowners and to a lot of our associates, expository is very important because the majority of people cannot begin to understand the nature of a project they might do without seeing it. And expository takes it from the theoretical to the practical. Expository is actually a very good real world crossover skill. Learning how to use visuals to keep your audience interested and to help explain how things work. All of our students, I think, that go on to universities and in, in a kind of professional capacity, they will be presenting to large groups of people, and large groups of people mean visual aids. When you're 35 years old, and it means that if you don't use the visual correctly, you're going to lose the $2 million contract, it's a hard time to learn. It's something that you can take out into the real world, too. You're in a business meeting trying to convince somebody to buy your product. You've got, um, you've got your charts and your PowerPoints and all the things that are part of today's world. Well, we always talk about how uh, communication has applications in the real world. And there's probably more expository speeches given in the real world than anything else. And in business and education, uh, people are explaining and informing about various things uh, all the time. In real life, in the courtroom, it's done to help a jury understand a topic so that they can honestly and fairly make a decision about it. In the workforce, that's what more people are asked to do, particularly at the management level, is to, all right, take this project and I need you to do a demonstration or I need you to explain this to the Board of Trustees. The skills that the students learn on how to effectively convey information and hold an audience's attention are skills that will serve them well in whatever field they choose to pursue in the future. When all else fails, you can still rely on those basic skills learned in speech and debate and figure out a way to communicate what you need to communicate to sell yourself, to sell your product, to sell the company you're working for. Businesses often require their employees to produce clear and interesting presentations. Many of the different types of speeches develop the skills necessary to achieve this, but none so well as expository. Expository speaking is an informative speech on a particular topic using visual aids. These topics can range from what it takes to become a weatherman or how to produce a web page. Students must research these topics and then present the information in an interesting manner, such as one might at a business meeting. Expository speeches are not only a valuable teaching tool, but they're also fun to create and present. I 
am a man. What? Don't believe me? Was it the long hair, the tailored shirt, the shoes, the fact that my clothes match? Well, you caught me. I painted my toenails this morning for crying out loud. And you know what this is? It's an eyelash curler. Kind of looks like a medieval torture device. I sometimes wear makeup and skirts, and on prom night, I'll be lucky if my mega heels don't make me fall flat on my face. Just one question. Why? Because of my gender, of course. Gender. It's the often debated intersection where philosophy, politics, biology, and sociology come together and attempt to explain why we are the way we are. Whether you're male, female, man, woman, guy, gal, girl, boy, gay, straight, intersexual, transgender, or confused, you can't detach yourself from your gender because, well, that's who you are. From womb to tomb, our lives are categorized based upon how masculine or feminine that we appear. Whether or not you realized it, when you first saw me, your brain instantly came to a conclusion about me based solely on my outward appearance. Gender is often represented by symbols which spring from Greek mythology. The symbol most commonly used for men is a circle with an arrow, symbolizing Ares, the Greek god of war. The symbol used for women is a circle with a cross, symbolizing Aphrodite, the goddess of love and fertility. Transgender persons often combine the two symbols. And then there's the artist formerly known as Prince. Make no mistake, however, the word gender is not synonymous with the word sex. The word sex refers purely to biological differences and is indicated by words like male and female. Gender, on the other hand, comes along with outward appearances and is indicated by words like man and woman. Modern society presents us with gender roles and stereotypes that indicate a person's masculinity or femininity. Society tells us that Barbie's a woman because she's got long hair and she's wearing a pink dress. But what if their roles were reversed? Ken would actually be considered very macho for wearing pink in the early 1900s. And as for the dress, well, just look at the Egyptians, the Romans, the Scottish, the French, the Grim Reaper, Gandalf, the Pope. Men have been wearing dresses for centuries. The real question is, what happens when one of these chaps needs to use the restroom? Being in a high school speech program and competing with students from other schools can be both a fun and rewarding experience. Expository is just one of the many events in competition. Students can compete with a variety of original speeches, such as oratory, original prose poetry, advocacy, and the expository that you just saw. These speeches help to develop skills such as research, organization of ideas, and presentation skills. To this list of benefits, add critical thinking and you have debate. We offer five different types of debates at our tournaments. Policy debate pits two speakers on each side of a significant issue of policy, such as resolved that the United States federal government should increase its transportation infrastructure investment in the U.S. Public forum is two against two in a shorter, less detailed encounter with a new topic each month. The current topic is developed countries have a moral obligation to mitigate the effects of climate change. Parliamentary forum debate is also two on two with controversial topics being given to contestants 20 minutes before the round begins. Congressional debate gives the competitor a chance to assume the role of a legislator and debate current issues. And the fifth type of debate style is Lincoln-Douglas debate. Lincoln-Douglas debate is one-on-one -on -one debate that focuses on a proposition of value. Students argue whether something ought to be done rather than providing the policy of how something should be accomplished. I affirm the resolution resolved. The United States is justified in using private military firms abroad to pursue its military objectives. Because the resolution uses the word justify, the value is justice, defined as giving each their due. The value criterion is to promote an effective military force. This kind of military force can be achieved by affirming. The use of private military firms ensures that the greatest outcome is achieved through justice. The government has the obligation to promote self-interest in order to protect the contract between the state and the people. An effective military force would allow for such protection and protect each person's due to the maximum. Contention 1. 
private military firms are effective. PMCs have training in specific areas that regular public soldiers don't. Scott Sullivan from February 2010 writes, The likelihood of both PMCs and public soldiers using violence reflect independently associated variables such as training level and military experience. Private military contractors possess training and military experience. Over 70% of PMCs employed in Iraq are believed to have served in the Western military institution. During their military service, many future contractors act as part of their military special operation forces, requiring the highest level of training. Private contractors' experience also provides crucial experience in military-oriented nation-building roles, such as civilian policing, of which the public force is otherwise completely bereft. For these reasons, I'm now open for cross-examination and points of clarification. First, have private military contractors performed human rights violations in the past? Although private military contractors did perform some type of humanitarian crime, so have the United States military. As such, both are essentially sensitive or both are easily able to commit humanitarian crimes, but both are essentially held to a higher standard or the same standard of the military code. But does that mean just because both the U.S. military and private military contractors cause human rights violations, that we should allow private military contractors to do them in excess? It's important to remember that both can be prosecuted under the same level of law. First, I'd like to point out a key statistic that Eugene provides, and that is that 70% of private military contractors are trained. Now, that means that 30% have, re have received no training in a Western institution, meaning they're not used to the Western style of military, of military and thus the Western style of policing. And that's very important to realize, because 30% of these private military contractors are thus put into a role where they're working directly with civilians, that each and every day they have to make sure they're kept safe. But at the same time, they've never had any, ex any experience in that type of role. And because Eugene's goal is ultimately to create an effective military force, we cannot use these private military contractors because many of, the, many of them are not used to their types of roles and they're getting first-hand experience for the very first time in dealing with nation building and policing, the types of things that private military contractors are typically put into. But second, it's important to realize that an effective military force has to effectively and painlessly end conflict. And that's something that private military contractors simply cannot do. And that's why I strongly negate the resolution, simply because private military contractors cause human rights violations, complicate the process of nation building, and ultimately make it more difficult for us as a nation, as the United States, to effectively police p uh, um, the public. And as a result, we cannot use them and they are not justified and they do not provide the most justice. And therefore, I negate today's resolution of using private military contractors in foreign battles. An entirely different type of speaking event in which students can compete is oral interpretation. This is one which many think is the most fun and entertaining. In interpretations, humorous, dramatic, thematic, or duo interpretation, students select materials from literature, such as plays, poetry, novels, short stories, or even other speeches. Students develop an interpretation of the character through creating voices and gestures, but without using props. My father spent one third of my life locked up. He went out every night dressed up in sharp suits and stayed out till dawn, if he came home at all. He had charm, he had connections. My father grew up in the Italian mob with wise guys. When I was younger, he always had money to throw around. He was always buying me dolls, he'd say. What do you want, princess? Anything. You see, that's who my father was to me back then, a man who, who brought me dolls and called me princess. I, uh, I never consciously thought of him with the precise term criminal, but I, I knew he wasn't legitimate like other fathers who, who pay their bills and went to their kids' track meets. I just loved to wrap my arms around his neck and to feel the smooth leather on his blazer and the smell of a fuckable Bane cologne lingering. My father was a big drinker, 
with a ridiculously low tolerance, and more often than not, a nasty drunk. July 1985, my 18th birthday. I woke up to my father's voice. The drunker he got, the louder he got, let me tell you. <laughs> and uh, I heard him yell, Gina, get out here. How many times had he pulled the angry drunk routine on all of us? But not today. Well, her birthday is not even safe, Dad. I, I tried to ignore him. But suddenly, he had my hair in his left hand, pulled me off the bed, slapped me with his right. He dragged me into the living room and started punching me. I had never been hit that hard before. Crying and trying to defend myself, I grabbed the first weapon I saw, the poker from the fireplace. He was crazy in a psychopathic rage, and I had no other intent at that moment other than to kill him. I swung. I swung to my washed innocence. To the father I wish was seated instead of this pathetic man, I swung wildly and in shock. When it was over, my father just gave up and limped out the door. There was this look in his eyes. I, I couldn't read it. Fear, self-loathing, exhaustion, regret. But when he finally came home, he said, Princess, I'm sorry, Princess. Don't even talk about it. What do you want, Princess? Anything. My father had become two people. The good man I knew he was, and the bad man the mob made him, and I, I forced myself to hold two different images of him. I kept the good one alive, even when no one else did, even when the bad one was suffocating it. Who was that man? What happened to my dad? Another original speaking event for competition is advocacy. Advocacy addresses a current relevant issue and not only provides information about that issue, but also offers a governmental solution that the speaker believes ought to be adopted. Students use critical thinking, reading, as well as research, writing, and presentation skills. Every day we are faced with issues that create heated differences of opinion. Emotionally charged arguments seldom lead to rational solutions. Advocacy skills are important because they take our thinking beyond the realm of we should do something to this is what we ought to do. I am a staff attorney with Legal Services of Northern California, which is a private nonprofit organization that assists very low income persons with various legal problems. I advocate in a number of different forums. I advocate in litigation, which is both in court and in administrative forums. And I advocate to administrative agencies and to legislative uh, bodies as well. My job is to analyze bills and issues that come before the Agriculture Committee and the Natural Resources Committee. I helped carry dozens of bills that ended up getting signed into law. But some of them related to, to crime and public safety and, and some related to uh, just a wide range of uh, family law issues. What I do as a directing attorney of a nonprofit organization is develop and litigate issues of statewide importance regarding poverty law. We have to do the research and then identify whether it, there is a legislative solution, a legal solution, or if it's a county problem. As an advocate, I find underrepresented points of views for underrepresented people and then I bring it to the forefront to mostly the dominant culture, the mainstream culture. In this case, we advocate for their rights. As superintendent of one of the large urban districts in the state, I engage in a great deal of advocacy, not only for policy, but for programs for my students and families. 
I serve on the Citrus Heights City Council and we are a deliberative body that uh, develops policy and goals for the city. As an advocate, uh, there are a number of roles that we play as council members uh, for our city on behalf of our citizens on all kinds of issues. Being on the school board, you are responsible for representing the school district on many different occasions and at different events. For most situations, there are things that you want to have happen and you have to be an advocate. You have to convince other board members to buy into what it is that you want. What appeals to me about advocacy is the fact that you can get your point across in a respectful way uh, based on facts and so that you can uh, be certain that decisions are made with the best facts. There are five seasons in a year. Spring, summer, fall, winter, and our favorite time of all, flu season. So how do you feel today? Is your throat kind of scratchy? Do you have a pounding headache? Or does your body just hurt? Well, what you need is a warm cup of tea, a long nap, and a good dose of Dimetap. By the end of the week, you are dead. <laughs> okay, now is this a little melodramatic? No, actually it's not as far from reality as you might think. You are the victim of the fatal avian flu virus. Now if I told you this was a bio-warfare terrorist scheme, you'd be much more concerned. But because I'm calling it the flu, you think it's just that season again. But really, it's much more dangerous. Last time we had a flu pandemic, people had normal symptoms of the common flu but died within a matter of days. And now, experts say it is not a matter of if, we have another outbreak, but when? A flu epidemic is the next big catastrophe that we can reasonably expect, and the country is phenomenally unprepared, said Erwin Redlener, director of the National Center for Disaster Preparedness at Columbia University. Another expert, Secretary of Health and Human Services Michael Levitt, warned that urgency is needed because the pandemic could kill up to two million people in the United States alone in a very short period of time. Hospitals would become overwhelmed, riots would engulf vaccination clinics, food and power would be in short supply, and social chaos would ensue. Initial costs in the United States alone would exceed $450 billion. That's more than eight times the United States budget for education. Therefore, I propose that the United States Congress enact immediate legislation for a crash program of prevention, control, and vaccination to one prevent the spread of the current lethal avian flu virus, two, control the impacts of a flu pandemic, and three, develop an effective vaccine. Providing a strong foundation in public speaking ought to be one of our top priorities. What students gain in critical reading, thinking, research, writing, and presentation skills is invaluable and used in all aspects of life. Being able to present oneself, whether in an, in an informal or formal situation, is priceless. Year after year, students and parents attest to the fact that being involved in a competitive speech program was one of the most valuable experiences of their high school careers. While public speaking may be the number one fear, it is conquerable. For information on getting involved in a competitive speech program, or if you'd like assistance in starting a program at your school, please contact the Speech Association at our website at cahssa.org. You'll be glad you did because... Competitive speech can help you improve your research and writing skills. Competitive speech will teach you critical thinking. Competitive speech will improve your presentation skills. Competitive speech can help you improve your scores on standardized tests. And it can also help you get into a good college. So why not join us as we all learn to speak up. Speak up.